Welcome everyone to the video and I appreciate as you uh, were coming on that you filled out our survey and our poll. We wanted to get a feel and you'll be happy to know, I'm gonna go ahead and end our survey. About 65% of the participants uh, said that they were covered, they weren't sure, or they hope not. So hopefully we'll get some answers to that. I will tell you, that uh, Carl, Matt, and myself uh, know that during this time frame, we will not be able to answer all of your questions, but our hope is to at least answer some of those. So let me first start by saying, I'm Don Ellswick. I'll be kind of the orchestrator of this uh, webinar. The other thing that I will mention, we do have someone monitoring the question and answers. Uh, the chat, if you put questions in the chat, we may not pick them up. So I'm going to encourage you to uh, please use your Q&A. And we have scheduled time at the end to try to answer those questions. So with that said, let me go ahead and get started on where we're going. So as adults, we all know we like to know where we're going to end up. So we wanted to let you know that our topics today will be kind of the scope of the new standard, 29 CFR 1910 subpart U. We'll also talk about some requirements for healthcare, which Matt will discuss. And he'll also talk about the mini respiratory protection program. Then we'll bring in our legal expertise, Carl, that will talk about incorporation by reference and some of the latest COVID-19 trends and scenarios. The other thing that we wanted to do, and I'm going to cover this uh, fairly quickly, is that OSHA also updated its guidance for general industry. So I wanted to make sure that you understood, obviously guidance is not a mandatory standard. However, as it's been enforced, there is an active COVID national enforcement program. And uh, definitely we wanna make sure that as we're uh, looking ahead at the standard that we do understand the difference between the guidance and the standard itself. So once again, the updated guidance shift uh, focus to protecting non-vaccinated and others at risk. It really uh, encouraged incentives uh, for vaccination. And again, as OSHA has done during this entire uh, pandemic, they've encouraged you to uh, link up with CDC data and best industry guidance. So this is some of our shared actions. I had a couple of people ask about, uh, you know, will we get these slides? We are planning to send out the slides, but we wanted to talk about some suggested actions. Those include, as we're going across the top, uh, time off, quarantine unvaccinated, implementing the physical distancing, uh, providing unvaccinated with face coverings. And then again, we'll talk in the ETS about how to verify vaccinations. And again, we'll talk legally. The other thing that we need to think about is how do we train workers? And the other thing that's very important at the end of this is retaliation protections and also applicable other OSHA standards, which have been uh, talked about. With that said, uh, we wanna quickly, and I know we're gonna talk about some of the things during the webinar about whether this applies to you. And with that to start, first of all, uh, it applies to all settings where employees provide healthcare services or healthcare support services. Again, one of the things that I wanna encourage is there is a great flow chart that's on the OSHA webpage and we'll be providing that afterwards. But I wanted you to see that potentially uh, some of the affected workspaces that are over here uh, on a right in the box and in particular, some of the support services and how they're defined. So with that said, what, when does the uh, Emergency Temporary Standard or ETS apply to non-healthcare facilities? 
Again, that is uh, medical clinics in a manufacturing setting. So I know a lot of people have asked questions about what about what's covered there? You know, is it uh, actually in my facility? And yes, those are walk-in clinics in a uh, retail setting. Again, you know, those are specified and then the non-hospital ambulatory care. So the ETS only implies to the embedded healthcare setting and not the remainder of the physical location. So I know a lot of manufacturers were worried about if they had a healthcare, would this standard apply to them? But these locations may be excluded based on one of the exemptions. And again, the exceptions to the coverage are covered in the 1910-502-A2-4. Uh, and again, the well-defined area is distinct from the rest of the hospital or the care with no expectations of uh, confirmed cases that will be present. The other example, a dialysis center in a hospital complex with a totally separate uh, entrance where all are fully immunized and screening. And I know we're gonna be talking about screening and uh, what that involves too. But again, these are just two areas where the exceptions apply. So some of the uh, exceptions to coverage, again, healthcare support. This includes, we use the example offsite laundry and some of the telehealth services where there is uh, no direct patient contact. The other thing that we wanted you to consider is when healthcare settings are embedded in a non-healthcare setting. And, and this is normally manufacturers that provide uh, medical clinics or you know, some type of services to the employees. As we said earlier, it only applies to the embedded healthcare setting and not the entire location. And again, when emergency responders or other healthcare providers enter a non-healthcare uh, setting to provide healthcare services, the ETS only applies to the provision of the healthcare services. So again, what is the determination that healthcare or healthcare uh, support facilities face a grave danger from COVID-19? The standard tried to address those and ensure that they provided sufficient protected from the protection from the COVID-19 hazard for healthcare employees. And again, uh, one of the key areas of this standard is the rights against retaliation and really informing, and we'll talk about that training. So all this good news, uh, when is it effective? I think most people recognize this standard, uh, parts of the standard took effect uh, on July 6th or yesterday, and the remaining portions, which we'll talk about, include some of the ventilation, will take effect uh, on July 21st. So with that said, kind of the scope and organization of this standard, and we wanted to give you an overview because I know a lot of people right now are Googling. So if you want to Google or look up the healthcare part of it is uh, 502 and then uh, 504, uh, 505 and then 509. And we will cover all of this. And uh, I know that we'll have some examples. So one of the things I wanted to do at this point, before I turn it over to Matt, I wanted uh, to uh, stop sharing results, which would have been good. And I want to uh, now pull up the next poll question. And I'm really curious, you can do it in chat too. Which areas of these do you think it will cover? So I'm gonna give you a few minutes Go in, pull up the poll question, and please answer it. And if you notice, we did say, because Carl's on here, hire an attorney. Uh, obviously, Matt and I want you to use consultation services. We think that's a good idea, but there's lots of other ideas on there. We'd love to have your input on And again, we'll give a few minutes here to kind of let that uh, go through. I think we've got about uh, 20 votes, so over halfway there.
And I am going to go ahead and close it, Matt, let you kind of look at the results. Thank goodness I did see a couple of people put attorney. So those are probably the attorneys on the call, but let's go ahead and share those results now. So Matt, this will kind of clue it up. At least somebody's thinking about consultation uh, services, but this gives you an idea of where everybody's thinking. And I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point, sir. Sounds great. Thanks, Don. Appreciate that very much. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to see that some folks are considering uh, using consultation. Looking over the list, I think uh, uh, some of you are red hot on some of those. Uh, this is a uh, this is a very comprehensive standard. Uh, having said that, it applies to uh, not every work site. Uh, this is a healthcare standard. Make no mistake. Uh, as Don mentioned, this applies to uh, work sites where you have healthcare services or healthcare support services, hospitals, nursing home, long-term care, healthcare settings in non-healthcare environments, such as the medical clinic that might be in a manufacturing environment, uh, the walk-in clinic uh, in a retail, um, the, um, and you also have autopsy settings in uh, funeral homes, mortuaries, and, and morgues. So um, move on to the, to the next slide. We've actually got quite a few items here uh, that we're going to be uh, trying to hit on here in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. <clears throat> as, as much as anything, because people are very interested in knowing, obviously, well, is there a way that we can uh, get around uh, this particular uh, rule? So uh, basically within the scope of uh, 502A, uh, the, the, the ETS would not apply to uh, provision of first aid by a non-licensed provider, Dispensing of prescriptions by pharmacists in retail settings. And again, that's just the dispensing of prescriptions. If there are health care services being uh, provided, that could be a game changer. Non-hospital ambulatory care settings if non-employees are screened. So that's hospital ambulatory care settings uh, if non-employees are screened. In hospitals, so that you're talking basically your your clinics um, where people would walk in to get uh, services not in a hospital. Uh, if non-employees are screened, you do have some exemption. Hospital ambulatory care settings, if they're in a well-defined area, and let me submit that if you have to ask whether you have a well-defined area, um, you do, you probably need to take a very close look at at exactly how you set that up. Uh, if there are questions about whether you have a well-defined area, uh, certainly you want to get those resolved. Um, in a well-defined area where you've got all workers fully vaccinated and non-employees are screened. Uh, home health care settings, if all the workers are fully vaccinated and your non-employees are screened. Off-site health care support services, oh. this could be like laundries and uh, other uh, support services that you would have uh, that are related to healthcare, and then health, uh, telehealth services uh, outside of a, a, a direct care environment. So <clears throat> the first things that we start off, and this is very consistent with a lot of your OSHA health standards, uh, is a plan, some type of plan. Uh, in bloodborne pathogens, we have an exposure control plan. We've got a COVID-19 plan. So in well-defined areas where we have no reasonable expectation that any person with suspect or COVID or confirmed COVID-19 would be present. Um, first of all, paragraphs F, which pertains to PPE, paragraph H, which pertains to physical distancing and physical barriers would not apply to employees who are fully vaccinated. You will frequently ask, well, what is the role of the vaccinated person? There you go. Uh, example, and I think we kind of went through this a little bit, if uh, you've got a clinic that's in a manufacturing facility, 502 would apply to the nurse's duties and it follows the nurse, whether she's in the clinic or out on the plant floor. Uh, it would not apply to the other employees out there in the manufacturing facility, even when the nurse is out there. Um, in a pharmacy embedded in a general merchandise store, right in your Publix or your Kroger, um, 502 applies to the pharmacist and the staff performing medical processes or procedures. Would not apply if they're just dispensing prescriptions or selling general merchandise. Next, uh, let's go back one, there we go. Uh, 
One more. There we go. Uh, we're not going to spend much time here because we're actually going to jump into each one of these uh, kind of briefly to uh, to make sure we make a full advantage of our time here. Uh, so we're going to start off again with the COVID-19 plan. Uh, it's going to be developed and implemented for place. Um, <clears throat> as is the, the way OSHA tends to go, if you have more than 10 employees, uh, it has to be in writing. Um, it specifies that there be a safety coordinator who will implement and monitor the plan, but not just one. Uh, they do allow for multiple people. And actually for a, uh, a plan that has this kind of scope and this kind of complexity, that is actually very advantageous, I think, for most of you. Uh, it requires, and this is really the, the meat of it right here, it requires that you conduct a specific hazard assessment at your facility. If your hazard assessment is going to be based on your employees fully vaccinated status, remember I said there were a few things that were exempt, you're going to need to have some way of um, proving that, documenting that. It could be uh, their card. They, OSHA actually gives you a fair amount of leeway in how you might do that. So again, as is fairly typical with uh, OSHA's uh, requirements for plans, They'll want you to seek the input of your non-managerial employees, uh, monitor the effectiveness of the plan, update it as needed, um, and then they're looking for the procedures to address hazards that you might identify, specifically procedures that will minimize the risk of transmission, that will help to communicate and coordinate with other employers. There is a multi-employer section in this uh, rule, and protect the employees who are in the course of their employment may have to enter into private residences or other physical locations um, controlled by a person that's not covered by the OSHA Act. So home health care, for example, uh, they need to be protected while they're in that environment, even though they're not necessarily in a OSHA uh, address or a OSHA covered facility. We'll start off here with patient screening and management. So in settings where you've got direct patient care being provided you must limit and monitor your points of entry. You'll want to screen and triage your entrance. Screening for the purposes of this rule means basically the questionnaire, the, the OSHA questionnaire. Um, you need to implement other applicable uh, patient strategies in accordance with CDC's uh, COVID-19 infection prevention and control recommendations. We will see this happening a, a number of places in this rule where OSHA has incorporated by reference a lot of different previously existing CDC guidelines. So if you've been keeping up with those, good, <laughs> because those are actually going to be folded into the context of this standard as we move through. So uh, examples of uh, patient management uh, would be telehealth and, and other situations. Employers must adhere to this, and this is just a standalone paragraph in the rule, just this one paragraph, employers must adhere to standard and transmission-based precautions in accordance with CDC's guidelines for isolation precautions. That's basically a straight incorporation by reference in a single paragraph that is nested within this overall rule. So some of the examples for that, you would actually go to that document to get more information on uh, tight-fitting face masks for patients, the physical distancing involved, hand hygiene, ventilation, uh, outdoor triage, meaning basically before you come indoors, we're going to see who's uh, potentially at risk. We're now into personal protective equipment. Face masks versus respirators. Face ma Hopefully everybody's got the difference between the two of those now. Uh, your face masks uh, designed to protect others more so than yourself. They must be FDA approved or authorized. Employers are required to provide a sufficient number of those and ensure that they're being used. Make sure you've taught people how to wear these things to cover the nose and the mouth, because actually in OSHA's compliance directive, that is one thing that they will look for when they go to do their inspection. If they see people wearing face masks the way that I see people wearing face masks, uh, those who still do, um, there, there could actually be some problems. <laughs> so cover the nose and mouth when indoors, when occupying a vehicle with other people for work purposes, 
uh, you want to provide a sufficient number of face masks to allow for at least one change a day uh, whenever they're soiled, uh, damaged, or, or more frequently if necessary. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you have a, a respirator that you're going to provide, but it's not required, then you're going to be complying with 1910-504. We'll get to that in just a bit, not just yet though. So there are some exceptions for face mask and face mask use. For example, if an employee is alone in a room, if they're eating, drinking at least six feet away from other people, or you've got a barrier between those folks, uh, if they're wearing respiratory protection, um, you have a face mask exemption if it's important to see the person's mouth. And in those cases, it's, you must ensure that the employee is wearing some sort of alternative, i.e. a face shield perhaps, if the conditions will permit it. Um, if it's due to a medical necessity, a medical condition, or a disability. So <clears throat> you do have that, that option to look at something other than a face mask, but you also are going to need to be able to make an assessment as to whether it, it will provide an equivalent level of protection as you would expect to get with a mask. If the use of a face mask presents a hazard to an employee of serious injury or death, uh, where it might interfere with the safe operation of a piece of equipment. So if wearing the mask is more dangerous than not wearing it, then you may be able to uh, get exempt from that. So continuing along with PPE, uh, respirators uh, and, and other PPE for people who are exposed or, or for exposure to people who have suspected or confirmed COVID-19, <clears throat> if you are Let's so say you, you're uh, in a nursing facility and you've got a COVID ward or you're at a hospital. Uh, if you have people with suspect or confirmed COVID-19, your respiratory protection is going to fall under OSHA's General Respiratory Protection Standard 1910-134. It's also going to require that gloves, isolation gown, or other type of protective clothing and eye protection be provided and used in accordance with 1910 subpart I, which is the PPE section of the uh, OSHA general industry standards. Uh, they do make a note that if there is a limited supply of filtering face piece respirators, that's what FFR means, filtering face piece respirator, that's your N95s, um, employers may follow the CDC guidance for strategies for optimizing the supply of N95 respirators. Continuing on with PEPE, respirators and other PPE based on standard and transmission-based precautions. Uh, use of the respirators when they're not required, when they are not required, the employer may provide a respirator instead of a face mask if they're following 1910-504. That's going to be your mini respirator uh, program. Uh, employers must allow employees to wear their own respirators instead of a face mask as long as it's used, again, in accordance with 1910-504. Uh, aerosol generating procedures on a person, these are gonna be uh, high potential exposures. And in that situation, respirators are gonna need to be provided and used like you would with 1910-134. Gloves, isolation gowns, protective clothing, eye protection, and subpart eye. Again, these are very high risk procedures uh, and uh, you need to make sure that you're, you're using your best. In fact, uh, we often recommend that if um, you've got procedures like that going on, that you actually escalate the level of protection from um, an N95 type respirator to maybe a powered air purifying respirator. You wanna limit the number of people who are gonna be present during those kinds of procedures, except to just essential personnel you want to perform that procedure in an aerosol infection isolation room, meaning a room where, that has controlled airflow uh, that will not allow that to uh, flow into other areas of the facility. And then once you've completed that procedure, uh, cleaning and disinfecting the surfaces and the equipment is mandatory. Um, <clears throat> in the section of this rule pertaining to physical distancing, uh, basically each employee needs to be separated from all other folks by at least six feet uh, when they're indoors. Um, this is another thing that OSHA will look for if they are there to do an inspection. They'll take notes and uh, photographs and things like that. Feasibility becomes a question. If it is not feasible for a specific activity, for example, there's some hands-on care that's got to be delivered, uh, then you should be ensuring that your employees are as far apart 
With regard to physical barriers, we're in paragraph I, required at every fixed work location outside of direct patient care areas. Not in the patient care areas, but outside. That's going to be your, <clears throat> your lobbies. <clears throat> That'll be uh, reception areas, uh, might be your triage area, um, you know, uh, where you got to pay your bill, things like that in these uh, facilities. Uh, at each fixed work location of direct patient care where six feet of distance is not feasible, you, you got to install cleanable or disposable solid barriers. Uh, you can't have a pass-through space at the bottom like to uh, put your checks and things like that, hand pieces of paper back and forth. And the barriers have to be sized and located so that it's blocking face-to-face -face pa face -face pathway uh, between you and uh, that, the person on the other side of that uh, barrier. Uh, cleaning and disinfection, you'll find that in paragraph J, uh, in patient care areas, in resident rooms, and for medical devices and equipment, you'll basically be following the standard practices for cleaning and disinfection that are found in, uh, you see it written right there, COVID-19 infection prevention and control recommendations and the CDC guidelines for environmental infection control. Um, examples, dedicated medical equipment for infected patients, and the use of pathogen appropriate EPA registered disinfectants. Those of you who've been involved in doing bloodborne, you're familiar with the EPA list. Uh, there's also an EPA list that covers the disinfectants that you would be able to use for COVID. So you need to make the distinction. If you're talking just COVID, there's a certain level of protection. If you're looking at bloodborne issues, it, there could be a different level of protection involved. Cleaning and disinfection, uh, continuing on in all other areas. Basically, uh, OSHA is going to say you need to clean the high touch surfaces and your equipment at least once a day. Uh, there's going to be doorknobs. There's going to be uh, other things that people will just come into contact with. Uh, if an employer becomes aware that a person who's COVID-19 positive has been in the work environment within the last 24 hours, then the expectation is that there would be cleaning and disinfection done. Uh, in accordance with the, the cleaning and disinfection guidance from CDC of any area, any materials, equipment that are under the employer's control that might have been contaminated. Um, if you're going to provide alcohol-based hand rub, it needs to be at least 60% alcohol uh, or alternatively provide readily available hand washing facilities. Ventilation. In, in employer-owned buildings or controlled buildings with existing HVAC systems, uh, basically what OSHA is saying is you need to follow your manufacturer's instructions and specifications on the in-place HVAC that you've got. Um, they're not requiring people to completely re-overhaul their HVAC systems, um, but they are expecting those in-place systems to be oper operated um, with as high a level of filtration as possible, if it's compatible with the system, you'll notice you'll see a bullet there that says use air filters with a MERV rating of equal to or greater than 13. The higher the number, the better the filtration, if it's compatible with the system. It also goes on to say though, if you can't get up to 13, use the highest that you can for the system. Of course, replace them as necessary, maintain clearance of outside air intakes because one of the things that also becomes important the dilution of control is bringing in as much outside air as you can manage with that. In certain situations, you may have to have airborne infection isolation rooms. So basically, we'd be maintaining and operating those in accordance with their design, construction criteria. They're there for a specific purpose. Um, and OSHA also says there are additional measures uh, to increase ventilation uh, in some of the CDC ventilation guidance. In section L, health screening and medical management, basically uh, we'll be screening employees. Again, that's the questionnaire before each work day and at each shift. Uh, Self-monitoring, in other words, the employee can self-monitor or it can be conducted in person at the site by the employer when the uh, employee gets there. Uh, any required screening uh, COVID-19 tests would be rendered at no cost to the employees. There is a requirement on the employee to notify the employer 
uh, of COVID-19 illness or symptoms. And specifically, here's what we've got. If there's a confirmed positive test or diagnosis, got to tell the employer. If there's a suspected diagnosis, and you've been told this by a healthcare provider, you got to tell your employer. If you've experienced a recent loss of taste and or smell, no diagnosis necessarily required, but this has happened, you got to communicate that. Or if you've got a fever of greater than 100.4 and a new unexplained cough, cough with shortness of breath, you've got to tell your employer about those things because that's going to be an action trigger. The employer notification would then follow from that because you may have employees who have potentially been exposed to individuals who have tested positive for COVID. Employer notification is going to be triggered by any positive person in the workplace except patients in the work sites where you have services normally provided to COVID-19 patients. Needs to be done within 24 hours. Uh, needs to be done for each employee who's not wearing a respirator or other required PPE, who's had close contact. You want to document when that occurred, who was working in that environment uh, during that period of time. Uh, next slide. You'll also have an obligation under this paragraph to notify other employers. Remember we said this was multi-employer, notifying other employers whose employees were not wearing respirators or other required PPE, who may have had close contact uh, or who worked in a part of the work area where that person was present during the potential transmission period. Now, what we've got here is a really nice chart that uh, I could probably spend the next 10 minutes going through. We don't really have time to, to do that. Uh, it basically outlines your medical removal options here. Um, this, I think, is it's pretty self-explanatory. If you wanted to get something that was a little more detailed, <clears throat> there is actually one on the OSHA website uh, that uh, goes into a little more of the particulars about this type of thing. Uh, so basically, uh, you, you have uh, uh, who people who meet the positive test uh, diagnosis criteria, they're going to be immediately removed until they uh, are able to return uh, to work and they've met that return to work criteria. Um, you've got persons who have suspected or symptom criteria, they're gonna be immediately removed until they meet the return to work criteria or they get a negative PCR test. And uh, for people who have close contact, uh, they're gonna be removed immediately either for 14 days till they've had a negative PCR test taken after five days or, uh, and then you have uh, working remotely uh, or in isolation is an acceptable alternative to removal. Um, OSHA got into some new territory here with medical removal protection benefits. So basically employers with uh, 10 or less employees are exempt from providing removal pay. Um, you can have an employee to uh, work remotely uh, or be in isolation. And if you do so, that person is entitled to their same pay and benefits. Uh, removed employees would maintain their regular pay and benefits up to $1,400 per week. Um, employers with less than 500 employees in the third week of removal, you're limited to only two thirds of the pay up to $200 a day. And then if there are other forms of compensation that are provided, that may further reduce the payment. When they do return to work, very important that they are uh, allowed to return to their same job status, pay, and, and everything else. They didn't lose anything during that period while they were out. Uh, your return to work criteria, uh, you're going to get that guidance from your health care provider or from the CDC. Vaccinations, employer must perform, uh, support vaccination by providing a readable time and paid leave for the vaccination and also for any side effects that might be experienced following that. Training, uh, you know, I'm just going to kind of let you read that over. This is all going to be provided to you as a resource. Uh, it's, it's basically explaining all the things that I just went through uh, about COVID-19 transmission, your policies, uh, your protection, uh, the procedures that you've got in place, your policies uh, for multi-employer uh, workplace agreements, so it's all pretty self-explanatory. Don, I ask you to move on to the next slide there. Continuing on, 
again, policies and procedures, PPE, cleaning, disinfection, screening, uh, the sick leave policies that you have that might uh, play into uh, medical removal, and then also the identity of the folks who are going to be specified in the plan. Uh, how employees can get copies uh, and uh, of the procedures and also of the uh, the written plan itself. Next, uh, you got changes in the workplace, changes in the employee's job. Uh, then you're going to be doing additional additional training to uh, uh, to cover that, uh, and then opportunity for interactive questions and answers. So just sitting down, having them read something, and then signing off on a piece of paper would really not be adequate. OSHA uh, is act, kind of doubling down on the anti-retaliation parts of this. Uh, uh, in addition to 11C, they've got a section in here that basically says you as an employer have to inform employees of their rights to protections uh, and you may not discharge or discriminate, uh, discriminate against any employee who exercises their rights. Um, the um, in, in requirement uh, in section P requirements that are implemented at no cost to employees, basically implementation of the requirements happens at no cost to employees. The one exception being employee self-monitoring uh, for signs and symptoms. Um, for record keeping, if you've got less than 10 employees, less than or equal to 10 employees, you're exempt. Your required records are gonna be your COVID-19 plan, all versions of it, a log of your COVID-19 positives, regardless of whether they're work-related and you see the type of information that they're looking for, gotta be recorded within 24 hours of learning that. People ask why, it's to help track other people who might potentially be exposed so that's why they're not necessarily looking at the work relatedness on that. Um, if you are asked to produce records, here's the schedule there. Your COVID-19 plan is, should be available to employees, personal representatives, authorized representatives, uh, individual COVID-19 log entries for a particular employee, again, to the employee or anyone with written consent or any redacted versions of the COVID-19 log. Um, need to be provided at the end of the next business day after request is received by the company. Uh, the assistant secretary, basically that's OSHA, you're, you're required to provide all records to them if they, uh, if they ask for it uh, during an inspection. Reporting fatalities and hospitalizations, uh, you got eight hours to report a fatality, uh, 24 hours once you've learned of a hospitalization. So our compliance dates, as we mentioned uh, before, uh, part of it's already kicked in. Uh, it became immediately effective uh, June 21. Uh, compliance with all requirements uh, except um, uh, paragraphs I, K, and N uh, of this are uh, already in place. And then full compliance, uh, that's going to happen in the, uh, uh, on the next day. The mini respiratory protection program will quickly that applies to respirator use in accordance with 502F4 when respirators are not required. If an employer provides a respirator to an employee instead of a face mask as required under F1, or if an employee provides their own respirator instead of a face mask as required in F1. So Here's a nice little chart that kind of gives you uh, the idea of, of when an, a mini R respiratory protection program or a full respiratory protection program would be required. Uh, your, uh, your normal full respiratory protection is going to have medical evaluations and so forth. The mini, not nearly so much. Um, in healthcare, um, here are your coverage areas uh, for exposure with, for confirmed or suspected COVID-19. You're going full program. Um, for aerosol generating procedures on people with suspected or confirmed, full program. In place of a face mask, when a respirator is not required, you can get by with the mini. Uh, for standard transmission-based precautions and good biosafety practices, you'll want to go the full program. Uh, responsibilities of employers when workers provide their own respirators, you need to provide the workers with a notification that basically informs them to Take precautions, take care of the respirator that you're using so that your use of the respirator itself doesn't present a hazard to you. 
Uh, additional training responsibilities for employers, if they provide respirators to workers, how to inspect, put on, remove, limitations, the capabilities of the respirator, storing, maintaining, inspecting the respirator, how to do a user seal check, how to recognize medical symptoms of perhaps the, the respirator itself creating issues, and the training needs to be at an appropriate uh, understandable level for the, uh, for the employees. Again, some additional responsibilities when you provide respirators to workers, you need to make sure that they know how to do a user seal check. Uh, if it's a tight fitting respirator, uh, ensure that if the respirators are gonna be reused, that they're being reused properly. Uh, and, and ensure too that it, the, uh, the discontinuation of a respirator when employee or, or a supervisor reports medical signs or symptoms related to their ability to wear a respirator. Not everybody can wear negative uh, pressure respirators comfortably. And so that becomes a, a potential issue. So that's it. That's the day at the races with uh, regard to the, uh, the different elements of the, uh, the standard. Uh, it was quick. Uh, this is where reach out to us in consultation. We'll be happy to help you. I'm going to hand it off now to our, our friend, uh, Carl, who's going to take it from here on uh, some of the legal issues. Carl? Hey, thank you, Matt. Can, uh, can you hear me all right, Don and Matt? Am I coming yeah, through? Yes. All right, great. A couple of things before I get started. Uh, number one, you need to remember that COVID-19 is a constantly changing landscape. It's a moving target. What we tell you today may change in a week, a month, or two months. Um, however, the issuance of this COVID-19 standard, even though it says healthcare industry that it's applicable to, does give us a sense of permanency. The second thing is what I'm gonna talk about today is informational in nature. It is not legal advice. And my malpractice insurance carrier is gl very glad that I said that before I begin talking. Finally, before you buckle your seatbelts, because we're gonna fly through these slides, we are talking about a COVID-19 standard that is directed to the healthcare industry. However, many of these principles that Matt covered very thoroughly are also applicable, applicable to all industries by way of something that is known as the general duty clause. So if you're in manufacturing, if you're in the service industry, many of these issues and points that were covered by Matt are applicable to you as well. So don't think that just because OSHA has issued this new standard directed to the healthcare industry, means that you're off scot-free. This particular standard may not apply to you directly, but you can be held responsible by way of the general duty clause. All right, here we go. Don, click, let's go. Incorporation, oh, we're okay, here we are. COVID-19 litigation trends and scenarios. Um, I would note that you need to train on these COVID-19 programs. That is your best defense, have a written COVID-19 program, and hold your employees accountable, okay? They have responsibility as well. If they don't follow the uh, program, then that is your defense. So you may think, gee, we don't have to worry about COVID-19. Everybody is vaccinated now, or I think the Center for Disease Control says that many of the um, social distancing and mask requirements didn't need to be continued because if, if you have 80% vaccination in your workforce, you're in good shape. But take a look at this. Only 45% of the US adults are fully vaccinated and it ranges all over the place from state to state. Mississippi is only at 35%, Vermont is at 73%. Mask mandates have dropped, but you can still mandate masks if you want. The um, legal environment is hot potato. I'm telling you, uh, Ohio is one of the top states for COVID-19 court cases. Alabama is one of the lower percentage states. But um, let me give you a few percentages before we move on to the next slide. Healthcare industry, 
has 28.6% of all of the cases that have been filed relative to COVID-19. Most of it is employment discrimination, believe it or not. Most of these cases involve um, failure to provide a reasonable accommodation to continue remote work. In Ohio, the healthcare industry is the top industry being sued in employment discrimination in Alabama, manufacturing is the top industry being sued. Um, in our office, we have quite a few cases involving retaliation and discrimination for complaining about an unsafe workplace. So it's all over the board. Next slide. And when we say all over the board, it's all over the board. It's everywhere from Wisconsin to North Carolina. There um, are law firms that are going to send their kids to college based on COVID-19 litigation. Uh, there is a New York City law firm. It's on the slide. They specialize in this anti-vaccination movement. We're going to talk about a high-profile case from Texas um, and the vaccination mandate. Here it is. Don't mess with Texas or don't mess with employers in Texas. The case is uh, the Houston Methodist Hospital case. Very interesting case. The, the, this may or may not be applicable all over the country, but some of the points of this particular case I wanna highlight. Um, before I, I move on, I, I neglected to say that the unions have actually challenged the uh, standard. Uh, the, the health care standard that Matt covered in detail. Uh, what they're saying is AFL-CIO and a nurses union filed petitions because they're saying, hey, there are other industries that should have been included in the standard and not just health care. That's just one of the litigation. This is an interesting case, Houston Methodist Hospital. This particular plaintiff uh, did not want to get the vaccine. Um, they even brought in the Nuremberg Code uh, based upon litigation after World War II. The uh, Nazis were tried and there was a code of ethics that developed after that trial. Uh, the, the plaintiffs were saying, hey, this COVID-19 vaccine, it's brand new and we don't even know what it is. It's not um, safe and you're causing us to do a criminal act by getting the vaccine. The judge said, no way, next slide, please. It's, um, it's horrible that you would even relate the COVID-19 vaccine to human experiments done by the Nazis during World War II. So the emergency use, use uh, provision is fair game. EEOC has said, yes, the vaccine is safe. Employers can mandate it. So the judge in that federal court said, yep, employers can mandate the vaccine. Employees have the choice to take the vaccine or not. If they don't take the vaccine, they can go work somewhere else. I have actually seen a form like this where people are saying, I'm not gonna take the vaccine for a multitude of reasons. You know what? Malarkey, don't buy it. Next slide. This is an interesting case. Once again, following up on the concept that COVID-19 vaccine is experimental in nature. The, you know, the, the, when, when attorneys, plaintiff attorneys don't really have real solid case based on the facts and the law, they bring in this thing that's called public policy. Um, and what the courts are saying is all the employee has to be informed of is they have the right to take the vaccine or not. If they accept the vaccine, that's fine. If they refuse a the vaccine, there are risks associated with it. One, you can get COVID-19, or the other one is you might lose your job, or both. The EEOC only applies, remember this, to federal anti-discrimination laws. Those are the Americans with Disabilities Act, pregnancy discrimination, uh, religious accommodation, what we call GINA, 
non, uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And the uh, EEOC, once again, has said the emergency use authorization is good. Everything's fine with that. However, different states, and I'm gonna say California and other municipal municipalities may prevent an employer from mandating the vaccine. So to hammer away again, it does not violate federal law for employers to require employees to get the COVID-19 vaccine. However, employers need to understand that if an individual employee has a medical condition that would, would allow them not to take the vaccine or be exempted from that mandate, or they have a religious reason for not taking the vaccine, you need to enter into a dialogue, which I believe we cover in the next slide. It's called the interactive process. So let's talk a little bit about the medical exemptions from the vaccine. The, you can require some sort of documentation and that's usually the biggest question we have. Just because I go to an employer and say, you know what, I have anxiety, I can't take the COVID-19 vaccine or I had a bad reaction to the flu vaccine, therefore I'm not taking the COVID-19 vaccine. That may not be good enough. Maybe you, unvaccinated employee, provide, have our, um, constitute a direct threat to the health and well-being of our workforce and our clients and our patients. Therefore, you're gonna get the vaccine or you can go work somewhere else unless you can provide us with some medical documentation that would establish why you can't take the vaccine. Once you do that, then you go through another conversation with the employee that um, allows you to determine whether or not you, you can reasonably accommodate this individual and whether they can continue to perform the essential functions of the job. Now, what we don't have time to go through in today's uh, seminar and webinar is what we mean by uh, essential functions of the job and reasonable accommodation. Suffice it to state, not only do you really need to have a written COVID-19 program, even if you're in the manufacturing industry, you need to have well-written job descriptions that establish the essential functions of that job. Remote work may not qualify an individual to perform the essential functions of the job. The courts have said, along with the EEOC, that remote work isn't necessarily a reasonable accommodation. If somebody has always come in and done their job at the workplace, we went through a pandemic, now everybody's coming back. That doesn't mean that remaining as a remote worker is a reasonable accommodation. So I just wanted to throw that out. Next slide, please. Religious accommodation. Um, everybody thinks they know what religion means, but you're probably wrong. Uh, religion has been held by the courts to even be a vegan way of eating. So some of these vaccinations uh, may have an animal product in the vaccine. So if you're a vegan, the, some of the courts have held that, you know, that constitutes a religious belief. Um, I had a case, and this is honest to God's truth, where a gentleman was a member of the Church of the Tattoos. He had tattoos all over his body. The employer had a dress code saying that uh, no visible tattoos were allowed. He said that was part of his religion and the case ended up settling. Nevertheless, we had to proceed on the basis that the Church of the Tattoos was a reasonable religion. I know we're not living in Alice in Wonderland, but that's true. That's what you have to deal with. So uh, going through the disability analysis, you need to decide whether the employee presents a direct threat without a vaccination. Once you do that, you have to go through the process, what we talked about. How do you accommodate this individual? Can you accommodate the individual? 
you engage in what is known as the interactive process. That's where you sit down and talk to the individual. It's a case by case basis. And for God's sake, please document all of this in writing. If it's not documented, most government agencies will say it never happened. If it's your word against your employees, you're probably going to lose. Can you incentivize employees to get a vaccine? Yes. It can't be over the top incentive. Um, you can pay them uh, maybe a day's pay to go get the vaccine, like an extra vacation day. Um, some gift cards are okay, but anything that is very large, meaning money or benefit wise, the EEOC is going to say you're over the top on that. And that's uh, getting into the realm of discrimination. And, you know, you have to live in my world before you can get there, but just little things is fine. Uh, yes, time spent in an employer-directed medical exam is payable under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, and if you're requiring them to even go get a medical test of some sort, that is compensable as well. Check with your attorney. Anything under the Fair Labor Standards Act, anything involving wage and hour is fraught with problems. So check with a good attorney before you launch into a program. Liability, that's sort of what we're talking about. Employers can do it. I had a professor in college, philosophy professor, who would say just because you can do it, should you do it? Well, that's your choice. Mandatory policies, yes, but you're going to face a risk, such as the Houston Hospital Association faced. Um, failure to accommodate, as I talked about, is the biggest issue that employers face. Workers' compensation on a mandatory vaccination basis, yeah, it can be a workers' compensation claim, but every state is different. Workers' compensation is a state-operated program, uh, insurance program, so it's a little bit different in every state. Here are some of the recommendations. This will be about the third or fourth time I've said it. You need to have a written COVID-19 policy, and it starts with a single point of contact for your employees to go to for questions and even requests for accommodation. Give them information. <clears throat> um, uh, we even provide forms for our clients where if an individual has a, a medical basis, we're going to request an accommodation, I mean a uh, exemption from the vaccine on a medical basis. We have a form. They can provide the employees. Same thing for religious accommodation. Uh, we also strongly recommend that the vaccines be administered by an outside party, a third party, that uh, reduces your liability. There would be the appropriate consent forms, disclosure forms, waiver forms, all information relative to the vaccine or the exemption from the vaccine is confidential in nature and must be held separate from other personnel documentation. Yes, employers may have to accommodate employees who are already vaccinated, but they still express concerns about COVID-19. And that gets into when I talked about every issue is a case by case basis. So it's confidential. Shh. Next slide. I we, we run into this all the time, especially in the Midwest. I don't know about the South. Um, uh, definitely the Northeast may not be friendly and talk to people, but in the Midwest, and I believe the South where Don and Matt are from, you tend to be friendly and you talk to people and you just ask them questions. How are you doing? Um, you know, have you have you gotten the vaccine? Um, why didn't you get the vaccine? Just shooting the breeze. Well, you know what? That gets you into all kinds of trouble. So treat it as a hot potato. Vaccination, either way, yes, they got it or no, they didn't get it is confidential. Don't discuss any medical details of an employee with anyone. Next slide. I touched on this temporary um, 
telework or remote work during the pandemic does not mean that that was a permanent change in the essential functions of the job. It's always a fact-specific analysis. You have to look at your state and local laws and not just the federal laws. Uh, you need to determine a voluntary vaccination process versus a mandatory vaccination process. Most of our healthcare clients uh, move towards the man mandatory vaccination. Most of our non-healthcare clients do not require vaccination on a mandated basis. So uh, Don, are you taking over from this point? Yeah, I gotta tell you, you guys did great. We're right on time. Uh, our next poll, I'm just curious, we ended up with most of the attendees staying on. So we wanted to go back now that the uh, particular webinar is over, how do you feel about this? And I wanted to address, and this may involve Matt, uh, I had someone, can you elaborate on a dialysis center at being a well-defined area? I hope after Matt's discussion that uh, you understand what OSHA is using for a well-defined area. And uh, Matt kind of gave you some suggestions on what's going on there. So I hope we answered that. That was in the chat. The uh, other questions we had, I wanted to go through while we were finishing the poll is, why do I want to worry about it in manufacturing? Uh, why do I need to worry about it? Well, I hope you understand uh, normally in manufacturing, we're still under guidelines. However, if you have a, uh, a particular medical facility, you need to really uh, look at that and decide who is covered under the new standard, who is not. And again, we've all familiar with the general duty clause and in particular, uh, what's been done previously. Carl, uh, Matt, do you want to comment on that? Or did I just do such a great job you're not going to? And I doubt that. <laughs> um, well, I, again, I, I'll, I'll kind of jump into the first uh, uh, question that, that did come up about a well-defined area, where OSHA doesn't have a specific definition in their um, rule about that. Um, I, I, I think it's, this is going to be one of those things where um, uh, you kind of recognize it uh, when you see it. So when we think of well-defined area, we think of, you know, there being a front door, there being some degree of barrier that separates this particular area from other areas of the facility where it might be a separate room or so forth. And, and again, I would submit that if you have uh, questions in your mind, uh, depending on your layout as to whether you have a well-defined area, um, then uh, you, you certainly need to, uh, to root into that because certainly OSHA could have those, those same kinds of questions. No, great then. And uh, also the EMT firefighters, of course, under this standard, someone asked about it. There are some specific on the COVID-19 website and in particular with this ETS, who are covered and it really goes to what the procedures are. I saw that question, but the one, Carl, I'm gonna kind of pounce over to you is uh, pay from the employer. We had a question, can you offer pay time off for pay or is there a special pay, you know, like ESL pay? So I know this is gonna be very specific, Carl. Do you wanna give some general guidance on that? Again, with the limitation, the answer is probably maybe. <laughs> or here's another great lawyer answer. It depends. Um, I think that, well, I hate to say this, but it does depend on how you are operating your COVID-19 program. If you are going to require employees to use their own time to do this, you do not want to require them to use their own time if you are mandating the vaccine, because that is an employer mandate to do something special for the benefit of the employer. And that would constitute under the Fair Labor Standard, Standards Act, uh, something that they should be paid for. If it's a voluntary 
um, you know, process where they go get uh, the vaccine and all that, then mo what most of the clients that we have are doing is they're, you know, they're offering to pay as a benefit. So two hours of pay, three hours of pay to go get the vaccine. I, I, would, I would walk away from forcing them to use their own sick time. That's ultimately what I'm coming down on that. Okay, great, Carl. Well, along those same lines, we had a question about requiring employees to use their own ETO, which I imagine is emergency time off. And the ETO in this case is combined with sick pay. So thank you for that. And if they don't have any ETO available, then we pay them COVID pay. So it's a complex right. question. But Carl, you want to take that one? I think you kind of answered it. Yep, yeah, I, I think I I think I did. Um, you know, there uh, I there may be depends on the state and depends on when they're taking the time off. Uh, but there may be some tax benefit to coding the pay as COVID-19 pay. So the question is actually more complex than it seems and might be something that you may want to check with an accountant as well. But I'm just going to conclude on this topic that I would avoid, if you can, forcing somebody to use their own sick time. Uh, great, Carl. Good advice. And again, what we're trying to do, we tried with this webinar to give you some generalities. I did put in, if you want a follow-up visit or, you know, if you're in Alabama or we'll even help you if you're out of other states to get that consultation visit on this, or if you just have questions, again, the email will go out with some advice on it. But we're at the time we said we would end unless... Uh, Matt, Carl, do you guys have anything else? Um, the only thing that I would add, Don, and Matt probably can chime in on this too, it kind of relates back to the question about the dialysis in a well-defined area. Um, having taken cases all the way through the review commission and into the court of appeals, what I found is if the employer makes a good faith attempt to comply with an OSHA regulation or standard, and you have objective evidence that you made a good faith attempt to comply based upon your analysis and your interpretation, that goes a long way. So if it looks like you did the best you could to determine a well-defined area, and you've done everything you can to protect your employees, that's ultimately what OSHA looks at. If you've done everything you can to protect your employees, then you're probably fine. You still should contact a safety consultant who's a specialist in that area. A couple hundred dollars or, you know, a few hundred dollars here and there is well worth it versus many, many thousands of dollars if you're wrong. And Matt, you want to add uh, what's the fee for consultation? Hang on, I hang was on. sorry, sorry, sorry. No, go uh, ahead. I'll let you have the final word on consultation. Well, for those who, who lip read me there, uh, you already know the answer. Uh, it is zero, zero dollars there. And, and just to echo, uh, Carl, yeah, I think ultimately, you know, uh, OSHA, when they go to, um, to do these inspections, when they do to make these assessments, ultimately, they will be asking themselves this, this one central question that is, what is protective of the employees. Uh, great point the, the good faith effort is very, very important. Uh, what an employer should have reasonably known and did they make that effort? Again, ultimately what OSHA will, the, the way they'll fall on these things is, did the employer make that effort to protect the employees? And if they fell short of that, well, it is gonna be a judgment call on the part of the compliance officer, so. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks for letting me participate in this, uh, Don. I appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you. And, and again, guys, thank you uh, for joining us. We're at that magic hour. We're going to end it. I think we've given you enough context. We will send out the slides in a PDF format with our contact information. And thank you guys for sharing time, and we appreciate your attention. And we'll end it now. Thank you.